Introduction to Neural Networks with C-Sharp, Class 12, Part 1. Hello, my name is Jeff Heaton. Welcome to Class Session 12 of Introduction to Neural Networks. In this class session, we're going to learn about the self-organizing map. The self-organizing map is sometimes referred to as the Conan Neural Network. This is because it was invented by a researcher named Tuivo Cornyn. We will see how to construct the self-organizing map in this class session. The self-organizing map essentially has two layers. It has an input layer and an output layer. The input layer has a number of neurons that represent the pattern that you want to classify. The output layer has a number of neurons that corresponds to the number of patterns that you want to classify the data into. For example, in a later class session, we're going to see how to use a self-organizing map to classify handwriting samples into the 26 Latin characters. So for this sort of neural network, you would have an input matrix that corresponds to a grid that the numbers and letters were actually drawn onto. And if you're just classifying letters, you would have 26 output neurons that would correspond to the 26 letters in the Latin character set. The neural network would then attempt to classify the, neural, the input patterns that it was given for training into these 26 patterns. And then any additional data that you would draw, it should be able to classify as well. There's an example program that allows you to actually draw the characters and see how well it recognizes the letters that you actually draw. In this class session, we are going to learn how to implement the Koning Neural Network. And in class 13, the next class session, we are going to see how to apply it to optical character recognition to recognize the handwriting samples. In this part, we are going to see how a self-organizing map is actually constructed. In the next part, we will see how the self-organizing map is actually implemented. We begin by looking at the structure of the self-organizing map. Here you see the structure of the self-organizing map. You can see that we have actual input coming into it at the top. This goes through the input normalization and then it goes into the input layer, finally the output layer, and the final output is determined as a winning neuron. We don't actually take the output from the two output neurons, rather it's a winner-take-all sort of strategy, so we take one winning neuron. This winning neuron is the neuron that classifies which group the input belong to. You can see that there's really two layers. There's the input layer and the output layer. Some texts will refer to the normalization layer as a layer and actually call this a three-layer neural network. However, these, this is just different terms that are used to describe the network. The normalization is a process the input needs to go through. A self-organizing map is designed in a bipolar sort of way so that you have, so that the inputs must be between negative one and one. Due to this fact, we need to normalize the inputs into this range and there are several ways to do this normalization. This course will discuss two different ways that the normalization occurs. We will see this momentarily. There is the z-axis normalization and the multiplicative normalization. Both of these methods are commonly used for self-organizing maps and they both have their pros and cons which we will review when we discuss those. There are no hidden layers. The input layer simply goes directly to the output layer. And calculation occurs very similar to the feedforward neural network that we've seen before. We take the dot product across the inputs and the weights provided by the neurons. This is how the output is calculated. However, a different training method than backpropagation is used for the self-organizing map. Input normalization is an important concept for the self-organizing map. This ensures that the input neuron values are within the range that the self-organizing map is expecting. There are two ways that input normalization can be done that will be discussed in this course. First is multiplicative, which was the original method that was introduced with the self-organizing map. 
There is also the newer z-axis normalization, which has some advantages over multiplicative. Multiplicative normalization is the original normalization type that was introduced with the self-organizing map. To use multiplicative normalization, you must calculate a, the vector length, which will give you a normalization factor that will be multiplied against all of the input neurons. Here you see a, the vector length being calculated and resulting in f being the normalization factor. This value will be multiplied by all of the inputs. Z-axis normalization has generally shown itself to be superior to the multiplicative normalization process. The Z-axis normalization is not dependent on the actual data itself. Z-axis is generally better except for cases where the input values are all close to zero. The Z-axis method is also used with a synthetic input. The synthetic input is added to the regular inputs. We don't want to discard the inputs completely with the axis normalization, so we need to include them in some way. The way that we do this is by creating a synthetic input, which is an additional input that is really not provided. It is a calculated value. Here we see the synthetic input being calculated. This synthetic input will be fed into the neural network along with all of the real inputs when the neural network is actually trained. You may be wondering when you want to use each of the two normalization types. In general, you'll want to use the z-axis algorithm because the z-axis algorithm preserves the absolute magnitude of the values. This allows for more accurate training. However, if most of the training values are near zero, the magnitude is not going to matter as much and the z algorithm might not be the best choice. It might be best to go with the more traditional multiplicative. This is because the synthetic component of the input will dominate the other near zero values when you are actually performing the training and returning the outputs from the neural network. This is a general rule of thumb that allows you to determine which of the two algorithms you might wish to use. You can also simply resort to trial and error like is often the case with neural network programming to simply see which of the two methods performs the best for the data you're using. The output from each of the individual neurons is calculated in such a way that is very similar to how we calculated the outputs for the feed forward neural networks that we looked at prior to this chapter. We use the dot product and the weight matrices to come up with an actual output value for each of the neurons. Here you see the output value being calculated for one neuron. We also then look at all of the neurons and choose the winning neuron with the highest value. This concludes part one. In the next part, we will see how to take the self-organizing map that we learned about in this class session and actually implement it. We hope you will continue with class session 12, part two. Thank you. This course is based on our Introduction to Neural Network Programming books for Java and also Introduction to Neural Networks for C Sharp available in both paperback and ebook format.